maybe be inspired to continue to love this state and to love this country that which you've given us to manage. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. Appreciate that. Photos in the back of my head just don't look that good. <laughs> <laughs> Director of Author Acquisitions, Mr. Mark Pruitt.
and then Travis Davis, Flames of Deception. These guys are big hands. They are traveling and better to be with you guys, and hopefully you can still buy and pick up a copy of the book while you're here. Now, I have a real uh, honor this evening for those of y'all that came to the first rally against censorship. You got to hear from a gentleman, and uh, I was, I don't know how I pulled it off, but I got to be in a small room with a handful of people the next day. And this gentleman was part of that discussion, and just kept listening. Here is uh, knowledge of the Constitution, in particularly IRS law and things like this. I was just fascinated with this guy. And uh, we have him here tonight. He's going to get to share with you guys. He's going to MC the evening. And uh, we're very fortunate to have him in a moment. I'm going to read this um, because there's too much to memorize, and I don't want to miss anything. And uh, how many of y'all uh, remember Robert Bernhoff from a couple of years ago when we had our first um, rally against censorship? He's the IRS attorney. He uh, is the founding partner of the Bernhoff Law Firm, SC. Civil and Criminal Litigation Firm in Austin, Texas. He has litigated cases in state and federal courts in the U.S. and abroad, focusing on civil and criminal tax controversies, complex business disputes, and investment fraud recovery. Mr. Burnoff was a touring musician and a business professional before becoming a lawyer. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin, in Wisconsin Law School, where he became one of the nation's most successful tax defense attorneys. Mr. Burnoff successfully defended several high-profile cases, including that of Wesley Snipes, who was acquitted of tax fraud and conspiracy charges. Mr. Burnoff is widely considered America's number one tax attorney and a constitutional law expert. Mr. Burnoff wrote the forward to David Thomas Roberts' best-selling book, The Death of Liberty. So with that, would y'all give us a big warm welcome from Mr. Robert Bernhoff. Uh, Guns N' Roses is Axl Rose. <laughs> uh, I used to be a singer in a rock and roll band. True story. Uh, but I could not do what he does. Uh, before we get going, let's give a big time round of applause for Dave Roberts, Defiance Publishing, all the volunteers who made this extraordinary event possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and all the staff at Defiance. Incredible people to work with um, on top of every detail and, and make doing things like this uh, look real easy, but of course they're not. Uh, and I wanted to thank all of you for coming out to support this incredible event. Uh, showing up is half the battle. The rest of the, half the, uh, the other half of the battle we'll talk about uh, a little bit during my presentation. Some other people here. Uh, so thank you uh, for coming out and supporting this conference on uh, cancel culture and of course, First Amendment speech, which is what it is all about. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to use this cord. All right. Um, I'm, I'm an astute observer of culture and politics. I pay attention to it for decades. Um, I also study some of these things. And the First Amendment to the United States Constitution's guarantee of free speech is under assault like no other time in American history. And that's not a hyperbolic statement. We live in a particular time where the threat to fundamental right to free speech is at issue. It's actually at issue. It is at risk. Um, and that is absolutely incredible. Uh, factions in the government, corporate media, academia, social media, and electronic communications platform have combined forces and they're waging an all-out assault on First Amendment free speech. I think we all know what the reason for that is. If you can, if you can stop people from speaking their mind on the issues and things that are important to them, it's much easier to control the public narrative and discourse, and it's much easier to control people. Uh, if your particular side is the only side that has the megaphone, it, it moves out all other voices, and that is one of the first steps to tyranny. Uh, and we're seeing it today. Um, what's the big deal with the First Amendment? And I, I, I say that a little bit rhetorically. Of course it's a big deal, but what is it about the First Amendment guarantee of free speech that is so important, uh, that's so fundamental to our American way of life? Um, one of our greatest 
Supreme Court justices. Now he was uh, what I would call a classical, principled, old school liberal. But he was one of our greatest First Amendment jurists, uh, Justice Douglas. And I, I can't add anything to three or four sentences that he spoke many years ago about the importance of the First Amendment. Free speech has occupied an exalted position because of the high service it has given our society. Its protection is essential to the very existence of a democracy. It has been the safeguard of every religious, political, philosophical, economic, and racial group among us. Free speech has been the one single outstanding tenet that has made our institutions the symbol of freedom and equality, and I would add, throughout the world. Uh, there's, in my view, there's never been a, a more apt, concise statement of the power of the First Amendment. It protects who we are, it protects our children and our children's children, and it protects the Republic from all assault. Because if we can engage in the public marketplace of ideas and express our thoughts, the best thoughts and the best ideas win. If we're precluded from doing that, you can bet that the worst thoughts, according to the second law of thermodynamics, will move into that vacuum and occupy that space. And that's what is increasingly happening today. So in order for an informed, vigilant citizenry to rise up and protect the First Amendment, which is what is required, uh, you have to know what the uh, free speech rules are. So many of us have heard the, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. And many people believe that's the actual Supreme Court constitutional rule. Uh, there are people who should know better, people who purport to be learned scholars of the law and the Constitution, historians. And you hear this today. You can turn on television and watch a news program, and if they're talking about cancel culture, you can hear that. They're actually still talking about a rule from 1919 that was overturned in 1969 by the Supreme Court in Brandenburg. It hasn't been the rule in over a hundred years. It's very significant. Justice Holmes, it's one of the most odious decisions ever issued by the Supreme Court. The United States v. Schenck, 1919. Uh, Schenck was a, a socialist. He was pamphleteering against the compulsory draft for World War I. That's all he did. He printed up some pamphlets. He was distributing them. He didn't like the compulsory draft. He was charged under the Espionage Act and, and sentenced to many years in prison. Uh, and Justice Holmes' opinion confirmed and affirmed his conviction and said the First Amendment didn't protect that speech. And so that was the clear and present danger rule. And I note that Holmes' famous statement that you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater was not part of the decision. It was never the rule. It was an offhanded comment that we lawyers called dicta. It was not part of the decision. So uh, in 1969, the Supreme Court overturned a, a terrible, a terrible First Amendment rule because you might hear the same tones echoing today, clear and present danger. I mean, uh, somebody in this audience's idea of what uh, speech would be a clear and present danger would preclude my speech. In other words, you can use that rule to censor anybody's speech, and that's dangerous. You have to have rules, clear rules that people can understand. So Brandenburg, Ohio, Clarence Brandenburg, by all accounts, was uh, kind of a knuckle dragger. He was a Ku Klux Klanner, and he had a bunch of his drunken buddies, several hundred of them, uh, and they were had a lot of weapons around. They were out in the woods, and uh, I won't say what he said. Uh, you can read the opinion, it's a short opinion, and the words are in the opinion, uh, but essentially he said that he exhorted his followers to go out and kill Jews and black people to save the Republic. That went up to the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, in a unanimous 9-0 decision, reversed his criminal syndicalism convictions and said that was protected speech. Even speech advocating violence is protected under the First Amendment under certain circumstances. That's not, I'm not taking a position for violence but this is important to know what the needs and bounds are. The new rule under Brandenburg, well, it's not a new rule, it's 50 plus years old, and some of the commentators, the learned folks on TV and cable news should really pay attention to it. Unless the speech is intentionally directed to incite or produce imminent lawless action and is likely to, in fact, 
incite or produce such action, that is protected speech. It has a subjective component and an objective component. So the government would have to prove there was an intent or a mindset, a scienter, as we say in the law, to cause imminent lawless action. That's the rule. Everybody should know the rule. And when you hear somebody talk about fire in a crowded movie theater, you should respectfully, uh, courteously correct them. So now that brings us to the Twitter file dumps. Uh, Matt Taibbi, investigative reporter. Some of the most extraordinary material I've ever seen in my life, and I've investigated uh, government misconduct cases, subordination of perjury, falsifying evidence, witnesses disappearing and having accidents, uh, parallel construction, where the government uses unconstitutional means to start an investigation and then lies to the, to the prosecutors, lie to the judges, to the juries, and to defense counsel and conceal that information. That's the doctrine of parallel construction. But even I was shocked by the evidence that the federal government, particularly the FBI, was directly colluding with Twitter to censor speech. This is an extraordinarily dangerous moment in, in, in America. And uh, I'm not going to take a position on Elon Musk. I don't know that much about him. But he has done the country a service by releasing the files. I know that for sure. Musk. So there's, there, there, there's another Supreme Court rule that's been around for 100 plus years after the Reconstruction Acts and the Civil Rights Acts in the late 1800s. The federal government cannot accomplish indirectly through a private party that which it is constitutionally prohibited from accomplishing or doing directly. That rule's been around for 100 plus years. You can't even cite all the cases. There are hundreds, if not thousands of cases. And what the FBI and other federal government agencies, imagine a federal law enforcement agency with the power of the FBI, the investigative tools, leaning on and directing Twitter to censor speech. That, ladies and gentlemen, is unconstitutional. Uh, so that case, those cases have been around forever. There is some litigation. We have an attorney here who's doing some litigation that's somewhat related to this. Mr. Davis is going to come up and talk about that a little bit. Um, so that's how, how we come to current and why this is so important. Uh, when you have big business, big media, big government, big academia combining in a confluence of assault, you have to rise up and take action. And so I would encourage all of you, I would exhort you, in fact, to protect your freedom to speak, express, and associate. Perhaps most importantly, protect other people's right to speak and express and associate. And even to the extent of supporting people's speech who you hate, we should all be defending that speech as well for their right to say it. For the right to say it. And uh, I will conclude with an old maxim, and I might have come up with this a bunch of years ago. I, I honestly can't remember. Uh, I do a lot of research and do a lot of reading. Uh, I actually tried to source it, and I could not find a public source quote, so maybe I actually came up with it. But I'll end with this. We tolerate the speech we hate because someday our speech might be hated. And the mission is ours. We have to take up the mantle, and let's defend the free speech rights of all Americans. Thank you. All right, well, I'm uh, performing a dual role up here. It was my little presentation. I'm also uh, emceeing this event and introducing some, but not all of our speakers. Uh, our next speaker is Cassandra Spencer. Uh, Cassandra Spencer has had an exciting career that took her through the journey of a lifetime while she was still in her 30s. Originally from Hawaii, she graduated from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, on an ROTC scholarship while being a single mom during that period. Her career as a public affairs officer for military intelligence in Asia and the Pacific Rim gave her an inside view into major world events such as the Edward Snowden leaks. Following a car accident that ended her military career prematurely, she found herself in Austin, Texas, center of the universe, uh, eventually ending up at Facebook, 
thinking that life would be settling down. Upon uncovering disturbing evidence of censorship, however, in 2017, she began to document what she saw and eventually turned the information over to Project Veritas, becoming the genesis of their highly successful whistleblower program that was Cassandra's doing. Uh, after Facebook security shut her in a room attempting to violate her civil rights, she lost her job and went on to work for Project Veritas, where she exposed corrupt politicians from Beto O'Rourke to Bernie Sanders, plans by Google to manipulate our elections using artificial intelligence, and separately, other evidence produced by her as a journalist has resulted in numerous investigations into election integrity at all level of government and at least two felony convictions. She is the best-selling author of Impact, How I Went Behind Enemy Lines in Our Struggle Against the Far Left, and is now the publishing manager of Defiance Press, overseeing the production of dozens of books and helping to amplify other conservative voices. Ladies and gentlemen, a big Texas round of applause for Cassandra Spencer. incredible welcome and introduction. Um, for those who aren't familiar with my story, which most of you shouldn't be because that was largely intentional, considering that I spent several of the past years undercover. Um, I was an 18-year-old college student, freshman at NYU, one of the most liberal schools in the country, uh, back in 2004. So this is during the height of the Iraq War. As students argued back and forth, about whether we should be in Iraq or not. As a, you know, teenager, I thought to myself, I was sitting there and observing, uh, back when being anti-war was a, a left-wing position, how that's changed. And I remember thinking, these are all privileged kids. NYU is not a cheap school. None of the people arguing about these topics, whether it's the professors, whether it was the other students, none of them would ever set foot in a war zone. So I decided that I did not want to just be another person, sitting there arguing about other people's fates and not being willing to step in myself. So I left NYU, decided to join the Army. Uh, I didn't come from that background. No one in my family had served since uh, my grandfather in the Korean War. But, um, so I joined the Army, I commissioned in 2010, and I go through my career. Um, I was at Fort Meade during Chelsea Manning's court martial, and I was at Schofield Barracks during the Edward Snowden leaks. Um, he actually worked at the Punia Tunnel, where some of our soldiers were stationed. So I kind of had this front row seat to a lot of these historic events, not thinking that it was really me who was going to be making a difference in any way. Fast forward, I get in a car accident, 2017. I decide I'm going to start my life over. So I moved to Austin, Texas. I hear it's a great place for young professionals. Get hired at Facebook. Think, yeah, this is going to be awesome. The Facebook cafeteria food's way better than any MRE that I had ever eaten. And so I'm doing my job. I'm an intellectual property analyst. And all of a sudden, one day, I kind of see a weird note on the back end of an account as I'm working a case. I kind of put it to the back of my mind. Think, that's a little weird. OK, move on. But then I kept seeing it. And I noticed a pattern. Facebook was issuing what they referred to as a de-boost on prominent conservative accounts. Some of these accounts are people you might have even heard of, like uh, Stephen Crowder's account, The Daily Caller's account. And all of these actions were being taken without the user's knowledge. Whenever I would action a copyright ticket, that user would be issued a strike. They would know what was going on with their account. But some of these folks were paying good money to advertise on the Facebook platform 
and yet Facebook was reducing their reach. And so once again, I found myself in a position of people started, this is 2017, so people were just starting to talk about tech censorship. And so I'm in a position where, what am I gonna do about it? I see this going on. So one night I get on Twitter and I see a tweet from James O'Keefe. Uh, how many of you are familiar with James O'Keefe and Project Veritas? So I see a tweet and he says, hey, if you're on the inside of any of these companies, reach out to us. And so I do one night, literally 11 o'clock at night, thinking, I'm never gonna hear from these people. They don't care. They reach out to me. And so I start sending them documents and proof of all the things I'm saying. Fast forward um, to when they released their first big tech story into Twitter censorship, as we just heard about. And they were talking about shadow banning at the time. Two days after that story releases, I go into work, my manager tells me, hey, we need to talk to you. So I go in and I am shut in a Facebook conference room uh, along with not only the managers from the contracting company I was with, but Facebook security. They tell me that I am being terminated, and so I ask why. They won't tell me. They say, Facebook security wants to see your phone. Ironically, none of the information they wanted was on my cell phone. Uh, this is my personal cell phone, not unlike the one I have now. But Facebook security, for nearly two hours, tried to get me to hand over my personal device. I asked them, I said, hey, if I let you see my cell phone, am I going to keep my job? No. Why in the world would I give you my phone? <laughs> so we have this roundabout conversation for two hours, and finally I'm like, listen guys, we're not getting anywhere. Can I leave? And I will never forget, for my whole life, what they told me. Well, legally we can't detain you. Well, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so as I walk out, I'm not even allowed to go clear my desk. And of course the first call, like any kid I make, is to my parents. And they ask me, Cassandra, was it worth it? You know, you just got out of the army, you're starting your career, and now you just imploded it. Without a beat of hesitation, I told them yes. It was absolutely worth it. So, I'm oh, sorry. So from there, I went on to become an undercover journalist. James O'Keefe gave me a job. And I began to do things that I never thought that I would be doing. Um, from being told to potentially dig through dumpsters with Beto O'Rourke staffers as we spent campaign funds finding, funding migrants coming across the border. Uh, one of my favorite parts of that investigation is how many times they discussed how much trouble they would be in if the FEC ever found out what they were doing. And one particular staffer, I will never forget, turned directly, not knowing that I had a hidden camera on, and said, you know, I hope the wrong person doesn't find out about this. <laughs> <laughs> Little did they know. So from there, um, I uncovered stories of big tech, including a Google executive talking about preventing the next Trump situation, which was cited by Ted Cruz on the floor of the Senate. I also was undercover in Bernie Sanders' campaign where there were Antifa staffers who were talking about things so extreme as putting Republicans into camps and even killing the Clintons. So, other things, um, I was called a very talented genius by President Trump and directly to James. <laughs> and um, a lot of people talk about voter fraud and election integrity. I have literally been chased off the lawn of a gentleman who I caught double voting in New Hampshire. And some of you may be familiar as well with the ballot harvesting investigation here in Texas. So it's one thing to talk about all these issues and what good journalism can expose. 
But one of the biggest things that happens is after these big Project Veritas stories, which by the way, who here has seen their latest Pfizer story where they are talking about manipulating the virus so that they can sell more vaccines? In fact, I, sidebar, uh, James was actually just texting me literally 10 minutes before I stepped up on this stage. Uh, they just released a video where that same gentleman physically assaulted James and snapped his iPad. <laughs> so, Take that as you will. But people always ask Project Veritas when I was there as a journalist. Now that you guys have exposed this information, now what happens? And that's what I'm here to talk about. Now what? Journalists can expose all the information possible, but it is up to everyday people to take action on that information. Whether that be, you know, if you find yourself in a position to do the right thing, if you're in a government agency, in a healthcare company, anywhere where there's waste, fraud, and corruption, speak up, let somebody know. Push on your elected officials so that they make actual, meaningful changes. Support the people who are doing whistleblower work. Because like me, I ended up on food stamps at first because, you know, I lost my job. And so that is what I am here to do. I am, I had them play just a girl as I came up here because that really is what I am. There is nothing particularly extraordinary about me, about my upbringing, you know, I'm five foot one, nothing crazy, I'm not a supermodel. I know people like to think that the only way Project Veritas gets content is some pretty girls on Tinder. That's not true. <laughs> but I'm here to say that each and every person here has the ability to affect change. That's one of the reasons why I work at Defiance Press, because we are here not only exposing new information, but we are here to change the culture. And thank you all for being here this evening. Spencer, ladies and gentlemen, amazing. Uh, next, I have the distinct privilege of introducing Justin Sheffield. Uh, without exaggeration, Justin Sheffield is a true American hero. He's a retired senior chief petty officer and warfare operator of the United States Naval Special Warfare Development Group, otherwise known as SEAL Team 6. He has completed hundreds of combat operations and is a recipient of the Silver Star, six Bronze Stars with Valor, a Purple Heart, and other sundry medals. He led the raid in Somalia that led to the successful rescue of a female American citizen and a Danish citizen. Uh, Justin now serves as president and CEO of All Eagles Oscar Foundation. Justin is also a best-selling author. His book, Mob Six, achieved critical acclaim and was on Amazon a number one uh, bestseller. Justin lives with his wife in this local community. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause, Justin Shepard. Sheriff's Department here, law enforcement. I see the yeah, I see the PD back there too. Appreciate you guys being here, man. Proud boys. I see y'all back there. Um, you all um, I was going to talk about my book. There's a much more important book in front of me I'd like to talk about, but. 
I want to open this up. Uh, you know, last time I talked in front of, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, this might be your first time here, but we had one of these a couple of years ago, and I told the hostage rescue story. Um, and what I'd like to do tonight is something a little different. I'd like to open it up to you guys for questions from the audience. I have 20 minutes. I thought I had 20, that says 10. All right, I got 20 minutes now, back on the clock. Nice. Um, anything you guys want, I've got a microphone up here. We can pass it around. Um, keep it clean, please. And uh, I'd like to open it up to you guys. And while, he, while somebody's gonna come up with the first question, or me, ask me anything. You got a question? So I wrote a book called Mob 6. It's about my, uh, it's mostly about my life at SEAL Team 6 and, and all the combat operations. I did like nine deployments to Afghanistan, uh, been to Iraq, Somalia, all the really cool, fun places. Um, my first deployment with SEAL Team 8 was to Colombia, and I would have given anything for that one again, because I thought I was a loser because I was a Navy SEAL coming home to my buddies. Afghanistan, Iraq's going on, and uh, I've never fired my rifle. Uh, ain't out of anger. So I was embarrassed, to say the least. But um, there's a lot of action in that book. You can probably read it in about two trips to the bathroom is what I tell people, about four hours. Um, it's a quick read. It's violent. Um, there's some profanity, uh, so I apologize up front for that. If you haven't read it yet, good to see you guys again over here. Um, anybody have a question? Yes, sir. The defense readiness. With the depletion of our military arms, it's going to take it out of the hands of the state, national defenses, military defenses. Our readiness as a nation, and with the civilian rumors of our coastal observations of the enemy out there off our coast, in the waters, all around, is this a fact of the matter that we should, the, the news is withholding this from us. Is that something that you might know about? I'm not sure if I understand exactly what you're asking. Is there enemy in our waters around this country? Is that what you're asking? Do I know that's what's going on? I would say uh, a lot of things to that question. Good question, by the way, thank you. Um, so, you talked about depletion of our uh, equipment. I think the uh, pull-out in Afghanistan is about the worst handled thing I've, I've seen in my life. Um, why we did that for so long and went over there for so long and fought and died and guys back here, all the veterans in this room, I'm sure this room's full of them, God bless all of you. Um, it's, it's a punch in the gut for us. The way that we pulled out of that, we gave all our equipment over to the enemy that we were ordered to fight, which I would fight it today. Um, why would we have left the bases like we did in Germany, Korea, everywhere else in the world? Um, some sense of stability. Those bases belong to China now, as we speak. Um, I don't know if that's common knowledge. But uh, if you think Islam went away, it absolutely did. It, it will turn into a haven again. And, um, you know, expect what's coming as it is coming. Um, our border situation, obviously, is a serious problem. Um, it doesn't seem like very many people in our country are taking it very seriously. Well, politicians in our country are taking it very seriously. Um, you better believe that there is uh, jihadists as well as cartel, as well as everything else coming across freely right now. And they're in our cities, they're in our communities. There's law enforcement in California. I know for a fact it's been told to, in order to, Leave them be and leave them alone. Uh, don't get involved. That's what we're dealing with. So I would say, you know, carry a sidearm, know how to use it, um, teach your children the safety about guns and gun control. Um, not gun control, excuse me. You guys know what I mean. Safety, gun control is in my mind. I hate that uh, term. Um, that's right, that's right. Yeah, go ahead. I'll tell you what, if, if you have more questions when I'm done, meet me over there at my booth, brother. I'll talk to you all day. I'll tell you all the war stories you want. Or if you want to know where the gold is, censorship on our military. Yeah.
That's right. That's right. That's why we're here, right? To speak against that, to stand against that censorship. Um, I'd like to talk to you further if you can. Go ahead, sir. Hey, uh, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your service just as much as myself as every uh, member county officer around here in law enforcement and military. That's everything we've done, but what I've seen, unfortunately, is the weakness that's going on and it's, it's almost like a cancer. So my answer is not violence. And we, the voting system alone is getting compromised so much. So we need, yeah, national, we need a national, national voting day, especially in state Texas, because we owe our rights to this state before anybody and God. So if we start on a national election day, thumb crap, if we convey criminals with the thumbprint, why can't we do it by the status of our thumbprint to vote for the state? And when we secede from every other state that this nonsense that's going on, you're going to take away gas stoves? I mean, all this nonsense that's going on, let's go to God. Let's go to God first, first and foremost. Because I didn't fight for this country nor did anybody else, nor did yourself, for a politician. We did it for God. God, country, Amen. family, family. Amen. 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 What's your name? What's your name? Thank you for your service. God bless you. Hey, thank you for that, man. God bless you. Um, I should get you up here. I don't think there was a question in there, but I'm all over what you were saying, man. Um, we can, you'll be carded to get on an airplane, I do it all the time, you'll be carded for everything, ID card, ID show, when it comes to voting, there's no ID required for some reason for, uh, you know, certain places and certain individuals, and it's ridiculous. Um, I uh, lean a little bit even farther to the right on voting. I think that if you pay taxes, you should be allowed to vote. If you don't pay taxes, you shouldn't be allowed to vote. That's my... Um, you have a question, sir. Go ahead. Yes, I have a comment about the surrendering of background Air Force Base. I'm While I'm saying that, I'm looking at your picture on the wall behind you. My question is, the uh, attempted court-martial of Master Chief Gallagher, I'm assuming you knew him, I didn't know him personally, I know the story. Why, why did that happen? Right, I, I apologize, I don't know a whole lot about the details of that. I do, I do know of the story, I believe uh, he uh, killed somebody, uh, maybe a prisoner, from what I understand. I apologize, I don't know more about that. Um, uh, I believe he was acquitted and found not guilty, so uh, God bless him. I, from what I understand, he served this country. Um, the guy's been to combat a lot. I've got nothing but respect for this kind of people. Um, we got brought up on charges a lot ourselves, especially at SEAL Team 6. Um, coming off target, sometimes there would be a lot of carnage. Um, in the daytime, that looks different than at night. Uh, bad, all bad guys look like they're sleeping when they're dead, it turns out. Um, so all of us have been, had our rights read to us. We've had to hire and pay for our own lawyers um, and keep them on retainer uh, for that very reason. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to stop us, even while we're on active duty overseas. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you for that, brother. Uh, does the military in all levels of military um, have a protocol to prevent the infiltration of our government from the inside? Is there ever a moment where you guys say, okay, our government's being taken over, let's act on these individuals? Isn't there a safe, like, a protocol? Yeah, I wish there was. Um, yeah. There, it would have been over a long time ago if that was the case. I hate to say it, because, um, see, I got in the Bush was in office. Um, we just come into office there. And um, I haven't been, uh, I'm happy with the leader since then. Obviously, I love Trump. I thought he was great. I know a lot of people, whatever, thought he was a good president, a good leader in this country. Um, he was different 
uh, you know, did he, did he say too much sometimes? Yes, maybe so. However, uh, the guy loved this country and he loved us. Okay? And that's who you want as a leader. My best leaders I can think of are guys that loved us. Right? It was different. It wasn't just leading the charge, getting a paycheck, I'm an officer, I'm going to move on to the next thing. I probably learned more, and I was telling somebody this earlier, I learned more from the bad leadership that I had. Um, but the good ones, it was always common ground. They absolutely loved us, they cared about our lives, and um, you guys know the deal, calm breeds calm, and, and that kind of uh, affection for each other uh, breeds more of it. And we have compassion for human life. I mean, we've been called assassins at SEAL Team 6, we, we killed a lot of people. Um, but we have compassion for human life. We saved a lot of people. Um, and uh, I do it all again. I have no regrets of that. But a uh, great question. I wish there was no way to do it. Um, you better believe that the government's infiltrated. I believe that. Um, I believe uh, utterly evil, a lot of it. Um, that's coming from my heart. Thank you for that. Thing. Absolutely. That's not minutes. really a question, it's a comment. Do do are you do you have a secure a uh, top level security top clearance security clearance, yes, whatever right. it's called and do you have um, top secret documents at your house? Do you know what fun this is? They're in my garage. I don't have a quote <laughs> Hi, um, I see this all over Twitter. Um, a young person, it ends up on my algorithm. A lot of young and experienced people talking about what they would do, what the police would do if they were given an order that they disagreed with morally. Like if the army was given an order by Democrats, let's say, to start rounding up citizens that they disagree with. So I was wondering, have you ever been given an order like that where you disagree with it on a moral level, and what did or what would you do? That's a great question. Um, given an order that I've disagreed with morally, I'm trying to think back. I've, I've, I've gotten a lot of orders that I disobeyed and disagreed with, but I don't know if it was moral grounds or if it was grounds that the person sending us out was one of those that didn't care about our lives and they weren't listening to the guys with experience. Um, one instance was uh, in Afghanistan, an op called Red Lion, where we were sent out and um, against all of us. I was a sniper uh, point man for the, this particular target. and. Um, you know, we walked all night, we landed way out, we knew this was bad, full moon, high moon. Uh, it was in, uh, uh, what was that, outside of the house, so, uh, Tora Bora. So, we went, uh, we went up there, we got over the, the crest of the mountain, long story short, everybody was awake. Um, I got five minutes, I can finish this. Uh, we called back, said, hey, everybody's awake. This is really bad. The uh, guy that we're after, we knew from intelligence, he was no longer there. He had gone out and crossed the border to Pakistan. So um, we were calling for Expo. We needed to get out of there before somebody saw us. Maybe there was 14, 15 minutes total. Um, a bunch of SEALs, a couple of Rangers, a couple of Air Force, a lot of those that we take with us, PJ, CCT guys. And um, we'd always grab some Rangers if we could. And uh, I think we had like two Afghans with us. <laughs> and uh, long story short, we went in um, through this maze at the side of a mountain and uh, kicked off a gunfight. Uh, me and my sniper partner uh, engaged a guy with an AK and um, pretty much kicked off the night. It was like kicking an anthill. Um, guys were all around us. I'd never seen anything like it uh, with men coming out with small children in their arms. And they weren't coming out to protect the children. Uh, they would send kids out and shoot through them, okay? Yeah, this isn't something that we would do. We would never even think of this. Um, throwing your wife into the doorway while we're making entry and shooting full automatic fire through her to hit us. This is something we would never think of. Every dude in here, I guarantee you, if somebody came in blazing, you better be getting on the kids and the women, right? That's how we roll. Um, 
Needless to say, we, uh, we got to the target area that we were ordered to go to, and it was a go thing. Uh, we were already engaged in about a two-hour firefight, um, surrounded, and by the grace of God, we made it out, um, killing our way out, and we exfilled sometime the next day. But uh, that's one example of an order that um, later on in my career, and I, as I became up and I was a team leader, I was able to squash those kinds of things at my level, which was great because um, if one person had been shot on that target, they would have probably all died. We would have had a wagon wheel on top of the mountain or something. Um, but that's a great question. Um, I do think that there's probably orders that go out that, that are, I, you know, I don't know about immoral. I don't know, that's, that's a great question. Man. Thank you for that. I got two minutes and 33 seconds left. Who's got some? Oh, go ahead. Yes, uh, Roy Austin actually had a hearing with Veteran Affairs where he called us extremists and clear and present dangers. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, were they extremists? Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I'm an extremist, it'd be on my faith in Jesus Christ. You know, I, it's funny, I had uh, a message prepared for all of you and um, looked around the room for a while and I realized that probably most people in here believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I right about that? We're not we're not extremists. It's ridiculous. Um, get used to the, the the call outs there. You know what I mean? Get used to it. We're always gonna be called out. It's not gonna stop, especially in Christians just wait till the news gets tighter and they make a sense of this, right? That's Texas. I promise you. Thank God we live in the state of Texas and we live in this country where we can I can stand up here and I can talk about Christ, I can talk about this word being the only word of God. Complete. Right? And I don't have to wear another sense of shirt. But some countries I can put on the spot. So God bless Texas. Guys, I'll be right over here at this booth. Please come talk to me. If y'all want to hear a horror story, I apologize I didn't tell me tonight, but I'll have plenty over there. Um, my book, like I said, it's a quick read. Uh, check it out. Thank y'all for your time. Thank y'all for being here. God bless you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Senior Master Chief, Justin Sheffield. Big round of applause here. said that if Dave Roberts invented the train stone run on time. They are running on time. Uh, I next have the privilege of introducing a man named Paul Davis. Paul Davis is a Texas attorney. He's a managing attorney at Paul and Davis and Associates. He's an alumnus of the University of Texas School of Law. He worked as a civil litigator for large Texas-based international law firms was Associate General Counsel and Director of Human Resources for Gooshead Insurance. He started his own law practice after being fired from Gooshead for exercising his First Amendment rights. He focuses his practice today on issues such as employee rights, social media censorship, and holds school boards accountable for the indoctrination of children. He won a temporary restraining order against Meta Platforms Facebook for censoring a former Texas gubernatorial candidate's account and has filed a class action lawsuit against Meta for the Texas Nationalist Movement, Texan, with the goal of filing similar lawsuits for all Texans. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Davis.
might talk a little fast because I wrote a 15 minute speech and they told me I only had 10 minutes, so. Uh, my name is Paul Davis on social media. If you follow me, you might know me as Fired Up Texas Lawyer. And uh, in case y'all haven't heard, we have a law in Texas against social media censorship. Yeah. But for some reason, even though this law has been around since December of 2021, I am the only attorney in the state who is bringing lawsuits under this amazing statute. And why is that? Why is that? Why are no other lawyers standing up against this censorship when we have a law against it? Uh, it's unbelievable to me. But I do have, uh, I've come up with a solution to this problem that there just don't seem to be enough lawyers out there with the conviction, I would say maybe the balls to stand up to big tech censorship. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about something new I'm doing at the end of this speech. Uh, so just to keep you, you know, hanging on your toes there. But uh, is there anybody out there who has not been censored on social media? No. Oh, are you, are you a fed or uh, maybe a journalist? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so, you know, if, like, it's just, if you're not getting censored on social media, if you're not getting banned, you're not, you're not speaking truth, right? I mean, who, okay, who, who has been permanently banned from a social media platform? All right, there we go. Those are the real heroes, right? That's the real badge of honor. What, what did you say? There are, only, there are only two genders, or men can't get pregnant, you know? You bigot. How dare you? How dare you? Um, so, or, you know, maybe you're more of a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist like me, like, you know, what, what misinformation did you spread to destroy democracy today? Did you say the 2020 election was stolen, or Kerry Lake's election was stolen, or, or maybe, maybe you said that uh, the, the, the Chinese virus, the CCP virus, uh, was leaked from the Wuhan lab uh, and was created with gain of function using U.S. taxpayer dollars under the direction of Anthony Fauci. Can you see why I get kicked off social media? Um, <laughs> but this is why I'm so passionate about freedom of speech on social media and why I'm willing to risk my entire law practice and livelihood despite being, I'm probably, I'm proud to say I'm probably the most grievous attorney in the state of Texas in the last two years. I think I've had 80 something bar grievances filed against me for what I do. The reason I'm, I'm so passionate about this, well, <laughs> Okay, who here, who here knows somebody who, who died as a result of getting the jab? Yeah, I think we all do, right? Who here has had a loved one or just seen somebody get murdered by a hospital with remdesivir and the ventilator and all the drugs they give you? Yes, it's, it's all, I mean, I've seen it firsthand and there's nothing more disturbing to me than a hospital telling you they're caring for your loved one while you know they're poisoning them to death is outrageous. And all to get federal money from the CARES Act. You know the average payout to a hospital in Texas where someone dies after getting treated with remdesivir and the vent is $180,000. And you know, do you think any of this would be happening if people were able to get accurate information on social media? Do you think anybody would get vaccinated if they were able to see all these photos and videos of massive fibrous blood clots being pulled out of arteries and veins of people who died shortly after getting the jab? I don't think so. I mean, do y'all think we would have a demented, fascist pedophile in the White House if it weren't for Facebook and Twitter censoring the little Biden laptop story? Yeah, that's, that's why I got kicked off TikTok, I'm sure. Um, but, I mean, would we be on the brink of all-out nuclear war right now if it weren't for censorship on social media where people cannot hear the truth about what is going on in our world? And that's why I'm so passionate about this. I think that social media censorship is one of the biggest, it might be the biggest threat to humanity today. And why is it that you aren't allowed to say these things? Why is it that you're not allowed to speak the truth? It's not because you're destroying democracy, I can tell you that. It's because there's this pesky 236-year-old document called the Constitution of the United States, where a group of people had the brilliant revelation that our rights come from God, Amen. not the government. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as long as we still share that belief, we cannot be enslaved. And make no mistake, the people 
who control Joe Biden, whoever that might be, whether it be the Communist Chinese Party or whoever, whoever's paying, giving him his paycheck. They, they want to enslave us. If you don't believe me, go read the World Economic Forum website. I mean, they admit it. These people meet in Davos and plan out how they're going to control our speech, control the flow of information. That's one of the biggest things they have to do. Um, the, UN, the UN has said that's a priority. And, you know, they want to put chips under our skin to track us. I mean, it's just the, the, the central bank digital currencies, if you haven't heard of that. All these things, they want to enslave us, but they can't if we have the freedom to expose them. And I don't know if you noticed this here, that a lot of people didn't attend the World Economic Forum, and that's because the word is getting out. And we need the word to continue to get out so that we don't lose our freedom, because we will lose our freedom if we're not free to speak our minds and exchange information in the public square of social media. And like it or not, that is where people go today to share their ideas and exchange information. And we will lose our God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if we're not free to speak our minds. I think Benjamin Franklin said it best when he said in the Dogwood Papers in 1722, quoting, in those wretched countries where a man cannot control his own tongue, he can scarce call anything his own. Whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freeness of speech. And that is exactly what they're doing. So let me say this again, this is an existential battle. Like Ben Franklin said, we have nothing if we do not have free speech. That's why our founding fathers made the First Amendment to the Constitution. And we can't be afraid of what we might lose by standing up and drawing a line in the sand right here on social media censorship. Uh, I know what it is to sacrifice for the cause of freedom. Like many of you, I was disturbed by what I saw in the 2020 election. I felt it was my duty to go to Washington, D.C. and make my voice heard. And just for standing outside, exercising my First Amendment right, just using my voice to protest, as is my right as an American citizen, my God-given right, I was tear-gassed, uh, I was hit with flashbangs, and I get back to my hotel room and I find out that some journalist had made a viral tweet about me that almost three million people saw saying that I stormed the Capitol to stage a coup, which is a complete lie, and I was fired the next morning from my job. I was blackballed by the legal job market, my fiance walked out on me, I found out how woke my church was when they turned their backs on me, I lost my house, I pretty much lost everything. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> you think I curled up in the fetal position and cried about that? You're darn right I did. <laughs> It was awful. Uh, I'm only human. So, uh, but you know, how many know God never leaves you in that place? So he met me in that, in that dark place and told me he still had a purpose for me. And to brush my shoulders off and get up and start my own law firm. And that was the last thing that I wanted to do. I didn't think I could do anything like that. But I did. And... The next week, Joe Biden announced the, something called a vaccine mandate in the workplace. And all of a sudden, I was the only conservative lawyer that I knew of in the whole country who was an employment law specialist. Do you think that was an accident? So I just want to say, whatever happened to you in your life, God's not done with you. He has a purpose. <laughs> I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing right now. I thought I was done. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to think. So, you know, I've helped hundreds of people save their jobs. I'm very proud of that. We're still suing companies uh, for wrongful terminations. But then uh, the social media censorship thing got on my radar when Facebook put Chad Prather in Facebook jail a week before the election, and I thought it was wrong. So I read up on this law, I filed a lawsuit, we're in court with Facebook the next day, and we got a temporary restraining order. <laughs> I mean, I don't think they knew what it did. It was amazing. So when Daniel Miller, who you'll hear next, called me and told me that Facebook was censoring the TexasNow.org link and anybody who shared it, I was excited. I couldn't wait to see Facebook again. I, uh, <laughs> what I want to do, there's a, this is a new law, so it has to be shaped with court opinions, right? So there's some issues, like right now, you know, we filed the class action lawsuit 
or text it. I also filed my own lawsuit against TikTok and Meta platforms because they kicked me off. Uh, because I was sharing informa useful information on how to fight vaccine mandates in the workplace. You know, how dare I do that? Can't tell people how to be free. So uh, they're, they're, we're trying to shape this law. They, they are trying, we filed it in state court. They removed it to federal court. They don't want it in state court. They don't want Texas to have a say in how its own law is interpreted. They want some unelected federal judge to do that. And they also want to move all these, uh, these lawsuits to the Northern District of California, San Francisco. Yeah, I wonder why. Because they have they have a form selection clause in their in their contract uh, that says you only, you can only sue them in San Francisco. That's the only place you can sue them. Well, I think Texas has a thing or two to say about that. Uh, the law is written in such a way that these clauses cannot be enforced, but it is still a battle. So we're fighting that battle. Um, we're going to shape this law. We're going to get favorable rulings, and then once we do that, we're going to roll this out with, with class actions for everybody. I don't want a single Texan to ever be censored on social media again. So the biggest issue in these lawsuits is that social media platforms think they have a First Amendment right to censor. Isn't that ridiculous? So I, I want to encourage you by reading something from I'm going to end with this. The Fifth Circuit took up this case. What happened was, when this law first came out, the platforms all sued Ken Paxton, our great attorney general, and the, uh, the woke judge in Austin who heard the case put a restraining order, basically on an injunction, on the law so that Ken Paxton couldn't enforce it. And that went up to the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit said, hell no to that judge, and this is what the judge said to this, uh, or the Fifth Circuit said to the idea that, that platforms have a First Amendment right to censor. It says, in urging, let's see, oh, here we go. A Texas statute named House Bill 20 generally prohibits large social media platforms from censoring speech based on the viewpoint of its speaker. The platforms are just to hold that the statute is facially unconstitutional and hence cannot be applied to anyone at any time under any circumstances. In urging such sweeping relief, the platforms offer a rather odd inversion of the First Amendment. That amendment, of course, protects every person's right to the freedom of speech. But the platforms argue that buried somewhere in the person's enum enumerated right to free speech lies a corporation's unenumerated right to muzzle speech. Today, we reject the idea that corporations have a freewheeling First Amendment right to censor what people say. That's what the Fifth Circuit said. So this is going up to the Supreme Court. We're going to get a ruling, I think, by June, and then, you know, pray for that. Because, I mean, if the Supreme Court doesn't go in our favor on that, we've got much bigger issues in this country. But if, it, if they go our way, it's on like Donkey Kong. We are going to sue the, you know what, <laughs> out of them. So if you want to be a part of these class action lawsuits, what we're doing is uh, you can go to my, I was hoping to have uh, a link to the, our new um, online community. We're calling it Class Action Patriots. Um, but the, we weren't able to get the link up today. So you can go to my website. It's just firedup.txlawyer.com. It's firedup.txlawyer.com. It'll prompt you for your email address. Just put your email address in, address in. Once we have all that ready, we'll email you and you'll be free to join one of our class actions. Um, you can also, we're, uh, you know, a huge problem, as I said, there's not enough conservative lawyers to go around. So we're taking everything that we're doing and we're creating templates. Uh, if you're getting oppressed, you know, by like a school board, for instance, um, you, we're going to show you how to bring a lawsuit to protect your First Amendment rights. And we're going to have cookie cutter pleadings. So that'll be a great tool for you. So um, that's all I have to say tonight. That's all the time I have. Uh, but if you want to uh, get more information, just go to my website, follow me on social media. That's where I put out um, just all the information on what I'm doing. It's just at Fired Up TX Lawyer on pretty much any platform. So thank you all so much. Paul Davis, ladies and gentlemen, fighting the good fight and winning. Winning is important. Uh, sometimes people in the Patriot community um, I think they almost kind of get used to losing. And, uh, I, I, I despise losing almost more than anything else in the world. And we all have to get used to despising losing and getting used to winning a little more. Uh, you guys
got a great guest coming up here, and my privilege to introduce him. Uh, Daniel Miller is president of the Texas Nationalist Movement. He's been an outspoken advocate for Texas independence since 1986. As the head of one of the largest and most influential political organizations in Texas, Daniel Miller has extensively researched and engaged the issue of self-determination, not just for Texas, but as part of a growing global trend. Daniel has been featured on every major news network and been interviewed by every major newspaper in Texas and around the world. He's been a featured guest on Fox News, CNN, CNBC, BBC News, RTTV. You might get in trouble for that these days. Uh, and many other news outlets. Uh, Daniel has been a vocal proponent of a fundamental re-examination of the relationship between all states in the federal union. A groundbreaking book he authored in 2018 was Texit, Why and How Texas Will Leave the Union. Channeling his years of experience, Texit explains the forces driving Texas independence, lays out a clear path to get there, and answers all the fundamental questions and objections to Texas reasserting its status as an independent nation. Miller, a sixth generation Texan, was born and raised in Northeast Texas, currently resides in Southeast Texas with his wife, Cara. Both avid Texas music fans, Daniel and Cara, operate Radio Free Texas, one of the first online outlets for independent music created in Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, special warm welcome for Daniel Miller. Our time. You want to know what that is? 
You want to know? Okay, that's cool. I'm just making sure y'all still with me. It, it's simply this. All political power is inherent in the people. And all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their benefit. And the people have, at all times, the inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish their government in such manner as they may think expedient. Oh, the heresy. You know, when I had my line in the sand moment, August 24th, 1996, I knew it was going to be an uphill climb. I knew that people were afraid to hear those words. But here's the thing. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the Texas Constitution in Article 1, Section 2. And did you notice that it said that those rights are inalienable? Think about why we are gathered here tonight to rally in protection and support of our inalienable right to speak our minds freely without interference, particularly interference from the government. And let's be honest, as we have all sort of felt in our guts, but all that has come to light, you heard Bob talk about it earlier, the service that Elon Musk did by dropping the Twitter files, we know now that the federal government hired social media companies to muzzle people like us. They contracted out the suppression of an inalienable right. And used our money. And I want you to think about how all of us should feel about being suppressed and censored. And now I want you to realize that that has been the issue of Texas since day one. The fact that we would speak the greatest political heresy of our time, a quote from the Texas Bill of Rights, that has been the uphill climb. And it's not just a muzzle, it's the fact that so many that promulgate those words and I'm talking about people in the media. I'm talking about establishment politicians will echo such untruths, half-truths, and falsehoods in an attempt to deprive all of us of our right to choose how we govern ourselves. You know, a little known fact, and Dave talked about this, or he might at some point, the Texas book. The book we released in 2018 because, look, if I'm being honest, I got tired of answering the same questions over and over, and it needed to be in a book, has been an Amazon bestseller six different times. <laughs> Didn't start out to be an author, don't think of myself as one, but six different times. But how many of you here knew that? Not very many. But imagine this, a book about Texas and the possibility of withdrawing from the Union and becoming a self-governing independent state, a self-governing independent nation among nations, a bestseller six times on Amazon. Now, I don't know how much rocket fuel that accounts for in Bezos' rocket, probably not much, but it's significant. How many of you knew about the poll that was released this summer that said that if the vote on Texas were to happen tomorrow, that 66% of likely voters would vote yes. Those are things that they don't want you to hear because they consider it a great political heresy.
Bob, thank you very much for that gracious intro. Thank you for uh, calling out Rose, because uh, I mean, she deserves a medal for 40 years with me, maybe, maybe as many as Justin has. <laughs> but uh, listen, welcome, okay, um, to all you deplorables, despicables, outlaws, insurrectionists, anti-vaxxers, Tea Party obstructionists, what else can I add to that list? I'm proud to be here with you. And listen, <laughs> conspiracy theorists, we can keep going here. Um, yeah, domestic terrorists, whatever they want to call us. Um, I mean, there's a lot to tell you about how we got here. And of course, the media hasn't delivered that story, right? But I'm going to tell you the truth tonight. Because that's what I do. I listen. And I know there's some children here. And so I'm going to be careful, but I'm pissed off. Okay? Um, you know, I took journalism in high school. Okay? That doesn't make me an expert. It doesn't make me an investigative reporter like Sandra. And wow, isn't she good? What a. What a what a blessing to have her on our team. What a blessing. Um, but before I go into this, because yeah, I'm going to get wound up and I'm going to forget to thank some people, I'm going to do it now before I forget. So, first of all, thanks to our great authors. A lot of them travel from out of state to come. Thank y'all. For those of y'all that have never written a book, it, it is kind of, well, for a guy. Well, I don't know, I guess guys can't have babies now, but it's kind of like having a baby, you know? A book is your baby, and, you know, I never take for granted that these authors have entrusted, you know, what they poured themselves into a book and allowed us to pu uh, publish it. So I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all for allowing us to publish your work. I appreciate it. Um, special thanks to, to Mark Pruitt, who helped... <laughs> And to, uh, I know there's a few people to take some vows here. Mark, stand up. Gloria, Kelly, over there in the, in the Defiance uh, team over there. Thank y'all so much. For the Defiance staff, we got a great crew. Um, we produce top class books that you could that rival anything from the woke liberal mob in New York. And I'm very proud of that. So thank y'all, and without y'all, I couldn't do it. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for all your help on this. Um, so, when I took high school journalism, I think my, in my, my sophomore year, um, you know, there's a few tenets that you learn in journalism. You know, the who, what, when, where. has got to be told a story. But also talking about, you know, getting both sides of the story, not just one side of the story. So, we're sitting backstage, and I'm talking to Kyle. And you guys are here, so you probably haven't seen this. Okay? And so, right now, I don't know whether y'all know it or not, but there was a live story, and I'll read you the headline. Okay, I bet y'all didn't know you're at this kind of event. Live updates. Rittenhouse rally against censorship kicks off to a small crowd, including Proud Boys. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, um, of course, the Proud Boys, um, the J6 folks, um, all those folks, you know, have been painted a certain way by the liberal media. And so they're just following that narrative, and you guys have all now have experienced being painted in the same light. And by the way, okay? <clears throat> And since we do have some fake news back there, we have some good ones, but we have some fake news back there. And we didn't censor them. We allowed them to come in here. I wasn't going to censor them and say they couldn't be here. Even though the reporter on this, the IU, the Reduced Chronicle, wrote two stories about the Southern uh, Star Brewery, okay, 
in both the local Conroe Courier and the Houston Chronicle, that you didn't think I was going to tell a story, you can leave. So, <laughs> wrote a story, and gets quotes from the Southern Star folks, never, gets, never calls defiance, never calls me, never gets the other side of the story, ever. Oh, by the way, she did get quotes from, from uh, Montgomery County Judge Keogh. And by the way, and there's a, I have a lot of differences with Judge Keogh. I like him personally. We have some political differences. But I will tell you this. He weathered a, a storm to make this facility available for us. So I think we need to call out and give you a thank you to Judge Keogh. The Chronicle published two stories, never got my side of it. Finally did get my side of it yesterday, but then in the article that was written, I, I, I don't think it's like, I don't know, I didn't get interviewed. Okay, so, you know, so this is what we're up against. Okay, this is the exact type of thing that we're up against. And, and listen, I, I'm not willing to take it anymore. This is part of why I formed the Fights for us, for this particular reason. You know, I got, oh, by the way, before I forget too, Thank you to all the volunteers. We could not have done this today, put this together without the volunteers. And the Chronicle, might, the Chronicle may call this a small crowd, but if we were at a church service, this would be a big crowd, right? Now, so, two years ago, we did the first rally for censorship, and we did it at the Marriott Waterway in the Woodlands. We had a great turnout, great fun. Sheriff Joe was the headliner at that. And uh, we had a great time. This time, I thought, you know, why don't we make this a little bit more intimate, as Dean mentioned, and, and support some local businesses. So the first business, I, I, I said, well, how, how cool would it be to do this and have alcohol there, too, you know? Um, and so I approached B-52 Brewery. How many know who B-52 Brewery is? And by the way, do we have that book over there? Do we have Cheetah over there? Yes. Can somebody run it up here for me? So, we put B-52, okay, and then about a week and a half later, we, I got a, an email from the general manager of B-52 Brewery and said, based on your book, now, I mean, we have hundreds of books, based on your book, we cannot in good conscience carry your event. And this is, by the way, before we had, we had booked Kyle to be here. We, we didn't have, uh, I was working on that, but it wasn't done yet. So I, I couldn't tell them that Kyle was going to be here. I thought, what, what difference was that? Thank you, sir. What difference was that? So, I get an email from the general manager of B-52 Brewery saying, well, because your book, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to handle your event. And I'm like, well, I immediately called him and said, what book, are you, what book are you talking about? We have hundreds of books. What, what books got you upside down? He says, looks like a cheetah doing that. Now, this is a children's book written by a, 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 a father and son combo. The son did the illustrations of this children's book. And this is a book about a cheetah who straps on a pair of antelope horns and competes in antelope races. So, and it's a great book, and it's very whimsical, and it's satirical, and it's, a, it's, it, it's awesome, okay? Um, this is the book that B-52 banned us for. And I said, well, let me understand something for a minute, okay? That, that, that book, okay, I, I understand you have a problem with the book, so what? I said, now, that particular author was invited, and you couldn't come here, so that's not, not going to be one of those features. So I was told that I needed to submit a list of the books that we are going to promote and a list of those authors and to file our agenda with B-52. Guys, this is Montgomery County, which a lot of y'all think is the rest county in the, in the state. It's not. It's one of them, but it's not the, the rest. But it's red enough that obviously B-52 doesn't know who their customers are. So I asked them for them to call for the call the owner. I wanted the owner to call them. So the owner finally called me, took him a day, calling me from um, snowboarding in Colorado. So I guess he came off the snowboard slopes, went into his local Starbucks there in Aspen with his tight skinny jeans on, his cafe latte, and his apple, and decided to call me. And so we had a fairly heated discussion. 
said, you know, it's, it, it, listen, I will, I will be the first to tell you that a business owner has a right to serve anyone who they want to. Absolutely. I have no problem with that. But don't tell me that you're that it, <laughs> that you're you're doing it for another reason. They didn't like this book, they didn't like the message of the book, they didn't like the message of our other authors, they didn't like the conservative uh, the mentor that we have, our mission, and so we were canceled by P52. And so we we moved on quietly. There was no reason for me to go public with that. I, I raised my eyebrows and, and the guy was an asshole, okay? But okay, I drink any more of their beer. Okay, so I thought, well, I've been to Southern Star. They, I've been to Republican events at Southern Star Brewery. I've been to Dana Miller at an event at so, so obviously a political event or something of this nature probably would be a problem for them. So we went there, we met them, Mark went with me. God, Mark is my witness. And two different meetings at Southern Star, and by this time we had book hire. And I was very upfront and told them that Kyle's coming. And you know what? And then we were told, no problem. No problem, you know. And then the next time I talked to him about the question or something we were booking with the event, I asked him again. No problem. Ask Mark. We got multiple assurances that having our event with Kyle was not going to be a problem. Then one day, I got a message uh, from the manager, general manager. He's a nice guy. I like him. His name's Keith. He's a good guy. I just, he, he just got caught in the He said, David, um, our CEO is asking if you would pull down the logo, the Southern Star logo from the promos for your event. So this was the first thing when something was up. I said, yeah, okay, why? I mean, that's your, I mean, I'll do it if that's what you want to do. He says, man, we're getting all kinds of grief. I said, from where? This is common. Where are you getting grief from? And uh, he said, I don't know, just my CEO would ask nicely if he would remove it. I said, no problem, done. So we did it. Then two days later, I get a phone call that I figured I was going to get. Um, he says, uh, the CEO said they can't do the event. They're going to have to pull out. They're getting way too much grief. Now, again, I said, well, he doesn't have the balls to call me. Why, do you, why doesn't he call me? He says, can you have him call me? So he eventually called me. And... Uh, I had, and, 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 you know, this is going to be a he says, she said, uh, but I have never been able to tell my story on this. So in my conversation with their CEO, I asked him, because he said, obviously, we got to end the event, we can't do it. I said, that's your prerogative. I get it, okay? But I'm trying to understand. I mean, you're in Conroe. I've been to where pumpkin events at your facility. What is the issue? He says, I am getting a ton of grief. And I said, from what, where? He says, well, mainly from groups in Houston and from HEB. Now, the HEB thing, because I didn't put two and two together, was completely out of left field for me. I said, HEB, and then it dawned on me, well, HEB carries a couple of cans of their beer. Okay? Um, and I said, well, I, you know, I don't want the poor guy to lose his, his beer distributor ship to HEB. So I, I get it. We'll move on. And again, I was willing to walk, keep my mouth shut, go find another venue. And several hours later, one minute you saw it, the post comes out, their, their social media posts start coming out with things like, no, we're not having a rally that doesn't align with our values. Which is interesting, because they had a gay pride night in June, um, so I thought they were really inclusive with everybody. Uh, but apparently not. And then, obviously, as, as the social media storm began, in which we gladly took part in, and uh, made sure our story was told, this thing started picking up steam from all quarters. I bet I've been on 30 interviews in the last seven days. But this drove, um, our social media went crazy, um, you know, it's kind of, in, in the book business, there's no such thing as bad publicity when it comes to a book, really. But this really wasn't about a book, it was about us. It was about our authors, it was about y'all. And so I wasn't going to sit idly by and stand for us to get, you know, trashed 
Um, for a lie to be told, and it is a lie, he did tell me that HCV would, now whether that's true or not, whether HCV really would, did threaten it, it may just be his excuse, I don't know. You know he had to look into his heart and say, he can't keep two stories straight. But you know, um, Southern Star, the one thing that always bothered me about Southern Star is I don't really like canned beer. So to celebrate the event, we have these made for tonight. Now this book is flying off the shelves, as are some of our other books. I mean, thank you, Southern Star. I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, you know, that's the story. Now, today, and, and you know, when, when we arranged this with Montgomery County, Montgomery County stepped up and provided this facility. I, uh, you know, I don't know what other counties were. They were folded. I've been told they were they were getting literally hundreds and hundreds of requests to cancel us from all over the country. I, and the, the switchboard was busy, they were getting emails, they got attacked. So I, you know, again, when I said I really appreciate Mark Keo, he stepped up to the plate and made this available to all of us. So I do, I do thank you for that. In the meantime, on the event right where you register, we shot up, I think today, the last time I lived there, we were close to a thousand registrants for this. And we knew, we're not done this, but when you do it hit free and the left can figure out a way to try to manipulate that and try to loan it, um, they, uh, you know, there's obviously some percentage of that that wasn't real. We have no way to tell. I mean, some of them were pretty obvious. You know, they, they sell Kill David or they have something bad to say about Kyle in their email or, you know. Um, so we knew a percentage of that were, were going to be fake. I get it. Um, but we deployed resources, okay, and the county made sure we deployed resources to keep people safe. You know, and listen, folks, this is what this has gotten down to. We're doing a rally for censorship. I had to have at least two calls with the, the uh, sheriff's department here and two calls with Homeland Security for this event. And the reason is, is because our damn friends back there the way they portray us, the way they, the, the way they, the way we look to the outside world because of the, the way the media bias is, they think we're all a bunch of nuts, okay? And that's the way they portray us. So I actually had people call me today who apologized and said that they were worried about their own personal safety, and no matter what assurance I could give them, they weren't coming. There's an area that the sheriff's department set up out there for protesters in case protesters are going to show up, okay? To be honest with you, I was hoping Antifa would show up. <laughs> but of course, you guys tonight are, are displayed that way, but I wonder if that reporter and that newspaper and those media outlets called the BLM and what they were when they were burning down the cities in their damn marks of rights. The world's upside down. America's in trouble. I, I think Daniel's answer is probably what we're resigning to. And, and thank God for it. But I'll tell you this, okay? When we started the, the, the story of Defiance Press, they told you a little bit about, Bob told you a little bit, I think Daniel spoke to it, you know. When I was shunned by the liberal publishing industry, and listen, this is about as woke a crowd, even back before we started using the term woke, I mean, when you would walk into a publishing conference, it was like walking into a, what do you call it, um, Star Wars bar. You know the, 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 the scene from Star Wars where it was full of creatures? My God, okay? I couldn't tell a man from a woman in those events, okay? I really couldn't, and some of them were downright scary. So, um, and this was happening 10, 15 years ago. So imagine what it is now. These four authors over here in the old days you would send their manuscripts to literary agents, okay? In, in hopes that the literary agent would be interested enough in pitching the book to the major publishers. Okay? The literary agents 
I, man, I, I'll tell you what, um, that's a different breed. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, one of the things that the client specializes in, and this is why they don't do it for me, do it for these authors, but support these authors. Because in a lot of cases, and they have great manuscripts, great books, but in a lot of cases, they're not going to get published because of who they are or what they believe or what the story is in the book or, or it could be anything. But look at the look at the Senator Hawley who has book, book pulled back, okay, by Simon Schuster. You see it everywhere. Everywhere. So we started Defiance um, because I went to a University of Missouri publishing conference. My book, my original book, Patriots of Treason was their number one political thriller for the year. My debut book for this publisher. We went to, uh, I was invited, because I was the number one book in that category, I was invited to go to this, this international publishing event that was at the University of Missouri. The University of Missouri is one of the top journalism schools in the country. Of course, I don't know if I'd send any kid to a university now because you're likely to get back a communist in return. But, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, even AM is off the tool, okay? Just so you guys think that AM is, you know, AM has got, go look at their roster, how many Berkeley professors are in AM, okay? Or, you want me to get up on a side track, they tell you about my youngest son who went to AM, his senior year, MLK breakfast, they brought in their, their speaker, they paid him $75,000, Danny Glover, who's the, the actor, but he's a, he's a rabid anti Second Amendment nutcase. Okay, um, you want to talk about radicals? There you go. Okay, so even AM is not new. Okay, so anyway, I digress. So I go to University of Missouri. Um, I wasn't I originally told the publisher I was not going to go, and then I changed my mind, but I didn't tell because I kind of had a sneaking suspicion. And I went there. They had their big booth along with all the other publishers, and guess what? My book's not even displayed, it's not even there, it's not even mentioned, it's nowhere. You know, it was their number one book, number one political thriller, fiction thriller that year. Nothing. And when I ran into the publisher, you should have seen her. She was, uh, when she saw me, she went, uh oh. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, where is it? She goes, David, you know, I'm, we're here at Mizzou. I can't put your book out. If I put your book out, I'm going to get ridiculed by every publisher here. And I said, okay, I get it, okay. I, uh, I kept the rights to my book, and that was the impetus. I said, you know, everywhere I go, I meet authors who hate their publishers. It's a very common thing. And I'm like, why is it everywhere I go, people hate their publishers? It's because the publishers treat them like, you know what, they, they treat them terribly. They don't pay them on time, they screw around with them. Um, and I said, well, there, there's a market for this. There's a market for conservative book conservative libertarian books. There's a market for a publisher that will take care of their authors. And so that's how the finance was born. And uh, we now have literally hundreds of books, uh, dozens of authors. Uh, some authors have done really well. We've had nine number one bestsellers in the last 12 months. Daniel is correct. He's been with number six, uh, number one, six times. He didn't tell you why, but I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, it was a great book. It was, it was number one anyway. But the reason why it hit six different times is because Amazon would jack with it. You know, I'll never forget, Daniel would call me up and say, hey, have you looked at Amazon and seen the book? And I said, no. And he says, go look at it. I looked at it. And his book was for sale for $333. And it took us three weeks for Amazon to fix that issue. Okay? Three weeks. So obviously he's not going to sell many books for $333. It fell off. Then we got the price fixed right, going back to number one. That kind of crap happened six times. Okay? It's not an accident. And you know, Amazon is no different than Google, which is no different than Facebook, which is no different you know, before most with Twitter. You can't get a live person, and we sell a lot of books through Amazon. I mean, unfortunately, that's the 800 pound roll in our industry. We sell a lot of books. But even with us, it's difficult to get to live people. <clears throat> and whenever there is a mistake like this, they blame it on algorithms. Okay? <laughs> and it's not algorithms. So, anyway. So I, I would just, not for, not for my sake, but, but support our authors. 
Um, they put it out all on the line. They're going to be here to sign books tonight. Um, you know, a couple of things that I'll mention, because um, my time is almost up. Uh, you know, the, when, you, when you hear the news, even here on Fox, even here on Newsmax, but when somebody says that the, the Bill of Rights or the amendment, none of the amendments are absolute, they're absolutely wrong. The Second Amendment is absolute. The First Amendment is absolute. Don't ever accept that. It literally means what it says. It is absolute. Which reminds me of another reporter who's not here tonight from the Texas Tribune. And this guy, um, he's, he describes himself, or the Texas Tribune describes him as the democracy reporter. Really? Well, here's another Cafe Latte, skinny jean, metrosexual um, piece of shit, okay? <laughs> Who wrote three articles on, on this, this function, and they never once reached out to us, never once got a quote, never once got a comment, nothing. And so now, and I hope you realize this, you can't believe what you read from any media, hardly. You can't believe what you hear and people better be looking with their own eyes to figure out what's going on. Because if that's your news information source, or social media is your news information source, we're in trouble. And now I'll, I'll kind of end with this. You know, Daniel mentioned, you know, how will, how will future generations look at us? And what did we do? I mean, this is the beginning when people will say that men can become pregnant, men can have menstrual periods. God, thank God I never had one. Um, but the truth of the matter is for most Americans, and y'all took out, thank y'all, y'all took out a Thursday night, we've got, I know probably a kid's school, got to go to work tomorrow, and yet you're here. You're here. So it's not a huge majority of people that will change the direction of this country. It's a well-organized minority that changes the direction of this country. Only was it two or three percent of the, of the American colonists who actually participated in the American Revolution including one of my ancestors. You know, um, when David talks about looking at future generations, I sit there and I look at it, and I hear it, and I see it all the time in the workplace. You know, and, and I'll say this, most men, most American men, okay, will leave bills and pay and will not look for the famous financial future but yet, they'll, they'll buy a $150 NFL jersey with another man's name on it, put it on the back, and waste four hours every Sunday when they can't pay the bills of their own family. I'm sorry if that hurts, but it's the truth. Most people are looking for their next three-day vacation. You know, most people are looking for a, you know, for a job. Um, you know, there, there's more to it than this, folks. And, and we, we better wake up. And I'm hoping and praying that our authors, the, author, the messages that our authors bring out in their stories, whether it's fiction, whether it's nonfiction, whether it's uh, is, is the type of message that's getting out there. I'm, I'm doing everything that we can to get these messages out. Um, some of them are just, you know, they may not have a message, but they're entertaining as hell. Okay? And they deserve your support. And, uh, and we're asking for it. These four guys, if you buy a book from them, please, please, you don't know how important it is. Post a, if you like the book, post a review. If you didn't like it, don't post a review. But if you like, if you, if you got one of their books, please post a review. That, that counts in Amazon's algorithms about where they rank those books. It's not just sales, it's also the reviews. So take the time. And, and I'm saying this as an author because I, I know how it feels. But, you know, if you like the book, help them out. Give them a review, okay? Um, share a book with somebody, okay? Um, tell people about it. And um, listen, I, I can't thank y'all enough. I can't thank you enough for the people that helped put this together tonight. Thank you for the bottom of my heart for coming. And uh, we're gonna soldier on. God bless you. <laughs> people in the world. Rob, Bob Bernhoff is a dear friend and probably the smartest guy I know, okay? Um, he was a patriot.
They're all patriots. Justin, what can you say about Justin? We, we, there's no way we would know what he went through and what he did for us. Thank you, Justin. God bless you. Look at the risk that Cassandra took under cover. I mean, it, it's just uh, and a new hero, Paul. Uh, well, we're going to get to know each other because there's probably some lawsuits in our future. Uh, <laughs> so, so let me bring up, uh, we're going to do this with Kyle. I can't wait to, to, for you guys to hear Kyle. Um, first, let me bring up Cassandra. Cassandra, come on up. So, I work with Cassandra every day, and uh, it's a harrowing experience. Uh, the, the best thing I can say about Cassandra is she suffers no fools, I promise you that. <laughs> Alright, so uh, now, the guest on. So before we bring him up, I just want to tell you a couple things. Um, I got to know Kyle. I was fortunate enough, Kyle and his girlfriend came out to my ranch, and... and uh, Hunted some hogs and we had some fun, smoked some cigars, and I uh, really got to know Kyle. And this is this kid is very genuine. Um, he's uh, it's interesting to see how the media has portrayed him because it's completely, completely false. Um, and you're going to see it for yourself. Kyle has a huge heart, um, and Kyle is a very articulate young man for 20 years old. Now, can you imagine going through what he has gone through at 20 years old? The poor man, because he is a man, you, you can't even imagine what his life's like. He can't go to a college party. Maybe he'll tell you that story. He gets, he tries to enroll in a, in a university, and they blackball him. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. The stories that you heard, um, you know, probably the... the I'm going to let him talk because he, he needs to tell it more than I do. But I will tell you this. Um, the, some of the things, that even though Kyle was acquitted, it's one of the one of the most grievous injustices, the way this went down. And you're not going to have time to probably hear the whole thing tonight. But I will tell you this. We have a very corrupt government, folks, like you didn't know that already. But um, look, help me welcome up our special guest and give him a warm Conroe, Texas welcome for Kyle Rittenhouse. All right, folks, um, I know that we all want to hear from Kyle, and so we are going to be doing this interview style because this is the rally against censorship, and so when I thought about what I wanted to ask Kyle, I really wanted to focus on censorship and how it's affected his life. So, did you want to say anything to start with? Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, for, thank you David, for introducing me, and we're going to start talking about censorship. Absolutely. So, um, obviously, Kyle, censorship, both tech, media, government, played a really big role in uh, the lies that have been told about you. And they're still being spread about you. Uh, would you say that censorship, explain how censorship has kind of played a role? Absolutely. So censorship has played a major role in my case, my life, being censored from my supporters being taken off of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, their voices not being heard, people only allowed to spread hate about me on that social media. That's how censorship has played a huge role in it. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Facebook routinely allows people to post links to you know, other people's legal defense funds, including members of Antifa. Can you tell me a little bit more about kind of your experience with the people who supported you that actively had an effect on your case? Absolutely. So Gibbs and Go supported me majorly. They helped me raise a lot of money during my trial to help pay for that. GoFundMe did not allow that. GoFundMe took down uh, a donation page made for me in the beginning. People were not allowed to donate through that platform. Facebook removed any messages for support, but they allowed but Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg actually went out and called me a mass murderer in a video. He defamed me in that. They didn't allow people to say I did nothing wrong. TikTok didn't allow things for support. 
Instagram, Twitter, people were removed off of these platforms for supporting them. So you just talked about the messages. So are you saying that even in private messages that people were not allowed to express support for you? Absolutely. I was blacklisted on these social media platforms. Nobody was allowed to support me. And we're talking about Mark Zuckerberg, who obviously I have a little bit of uh, experience. I've never met him directly. But tell me what it was like watching one of the world's richest, most powerful men uh, call you a mass murderer when at the time, I believe, you hadn't even been to trial yet. Absolutely. I don't know if he saw the videos or not, but that was not mass murder. That was self-defense, and he attacked me in the middle. Um, let me be the first to say that I speak for myself, and I speak for Defiance Press, and I think I speak for everyone except for maybe a few hostile media in this room, that we are very glad that you're still here with us today. information was sort of kept from the public, that you felt like they should have known about your case, and did you ever worry that the fact that accurate information wasn't getting out, and in fact blatantly false information was being reported, were you ever worried about how that would have impacted your criminal trial? A little bit, but I knew God was on my side, and he was watching over me, and I knew he was You know, your faith brought you through this, but surely there must have been some point where you were worried, you know, even as a person of faith, where there are outside forces. Of course, great things happen to wonderful people, you know, good people of faith. So tell me more about that. Absolutely. When I saw the media attacks and the media saying that I shot black people or saying I shot I went down there across state lines to open fire at a BLM protest and see, and I see all these false narratives. I was like, wow, what if people actually believe this? If the media won't look at the facts, what if the general public won't look at the facts? These are the people that the public, the public is getting their information from. They're lying to people, and they're doing it like they with easily accessible video. And of course, during that time, you know, obviously you weren't active on social media. How frustrating was it for you? I can only imagine. Tell me what that was like, that you felt like you didn't even have a voice during that time. It was scary. I'm glad I had some people out there defending me and speaking the truth, such as my great attorneys, Mark Richards, Coach Ross, and Natalie Wisco. But just seeing that the media is getting away with, trying to get away with everything they're saying, and that some people are believing them. Some people believe what they are telling them, and they buy into it. I get told, I, I got told a story the other day um, from a friend of mine who knows Kevin Hart, and he was asking Kevin Hart about what he thought. And Kevin Hart was like, oh, isn't he the guy that shot the black people? And he had to educate him on what happened. Wait, so are you talking about the actor Kevin Hart? Yes. I, I heard this story like two days ago, and I thought it would be a good one to tell. Like, he, he had no idea what happened, and like, thought I shot black people. Wow. That's so wild to me. So how long, just refresh my memory, how long has it been since you were acquitted? I was acquitted on November 19th of 2021. And over a year <coughs> later, a major Hollywood actor, so somebody who's... This was, there's several Hollywood actors that continue, that think I shot black people, that continue to defame me. Some are willing to listen, listen to the facts, sit down and figure things out and watch the video, but some don't care. They continue to lie to their audience of a million plus followers. That has to be just incredibly frustrating. Um, so now, was it only the media, or um, I know we talked a little bit about how Facebook was involved, but talk a little bit more about how not only the mainstream media has perpetuated these continual lies, just flat out falsehoods, not even things that could be misinterpreted. Um, black and white facts. Um, tell me how the tech companies really kind of affected that as well. Well, somebody hacked into Gibson Go and they doxed their donor list. I don't know if you remember that, where police officers were getting, got, a police officer got fired from his job. He got, because somebody doxed Gibson Go and 
didn't agree with the message he posted. And that's what the media could do. They showed up to his house, and I think his name was Lieutenant, Lieutenant William Kelly. They knocked on his door, and he got fired from um, the police department in, uh, I think it was in Norfolk, Virginia. So that's another example of how the media is running other people's lives, doxing people, not telling the truth because they don't want to see me get a fair trial. And so, um, just to kind of be sure that we're telling the full story, did this police lieutenant say anything that, you know, would warrant that kind of backlash? I don't recall exactly what it says, but it doesn't matter. He donated it, honestly. He, he has the first amendment kind of right to say whatever he wants. So they went, the media... <laughs> So this police lieutenant exercised his right to donate anonymously to your campaign. And for that, just to be clear, um, people who were against you, docs to give send a go, put this information out to the public and attempted to ruin this man's life. Absolutely. And then there's pictures of this police chief marching with Black Lives Matter, holding the BLM signs up while that police officer was fired for supporting me. That is, that's wild, because I absolutely think that, you know, the police chief, if he wants to make a political statement, he should be able to. But I think one of the issues of why we're here talking is that everybody deserves First Amendment rights. Absolutely. And so, um, that goes into how, kind of how the media and the tech companies are doing it. But this has even bigger ramifications because at the end of the day, the First Amendment is a mandate to the government, right? Like Southern Star Brewery, they canceled us. It was a, kind of part of my language of a shitty move, but they have a right to do it as a business. But can you tell us, you know, how did the state, or like the FBI, or any of the law enforcement organizations, or the people prosecuting you, um, did they ever withhold any information that would have helped you in a court of law? Yes, yeah, so there was a drone video during my trial that the state had, and we didn't get in until about halfway through my trial. I know some of you guys probably remember that whole fiasco. There was also FBI surveillance video flying from a plane, and the state gave us a decompressed version of it, which the state used a software called Handbrake to compress that file and then send it over to us. And that was that was part of something that I don't think was fair. I don't think that they they had a, they had the enhanced version, they had the good version of it. We did not. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Because just in case people I know that I watched the trial, I do remember a little bit of that, but let's just refresh everybody's memory on how the state, who absolutely, more than any media organization, tech company, has an obligation to uphold the First Amendment, and how that affected not only you in the court of law, but essentially in the court of public opinion as well. So the state came up with their own narrative. I can't get too much into details with it because I am being sued. Um, so I can't get too much into that, but they came up with this whole false narrative that isn't true. And they were, they were using this drone video to say that this is what happened when we know that's not what happened and we proved that that's not what happened. And they tried to change the public narrative saying, I chased somebody down. I don't know if you remember that. When I'm on video being chased down, but they tried to use the drone, they didn't do that, and tried to sway the jury when that's just not true. How did that kind of, that has to shape your opinion on government. How would you say that kind of, affected just your overall world view. Because I know when I was your age, um, you know, I briefly told the story of why I ended up joining the military. I had a very um, kind of rosy-eyed view of the world when I was your age. Tell me how, when you experience something like that, how it affects you. I was ticked off, because this, this is our government. They're supposed to uphold the Constitution, they're supposed to tell the truth, and I did as a citizen, I deserve the right to a fair trial, and I don't think I was, be, I was given a fair trial in that, in that instance when the state was lying and they weren't presenting all the facts as they were. It wasn't my fault that they had bad facts. 
they have, they're the ones that chose to charge me. Absolutely. And do you think that because, you know, maybe they didn't have a case that was strong enough for a court of law that they tried to then take this to the court of public opinion? I think so. I think they tried to use a lot of things to sway the public opinion. Sorry, I'm getting told my microphone wasn't close to my face. <laughs> so, what was I saying? Sorry. Um, yes, I absolutely do think that they tried to sway the public opinion. I think that them putting stuff out there, them lying, them filing motions, were trying to maybe influence a potential juror member into convicting me. And uh, last I checked, I know we have a lot of lawyers in the room. Um, I don't think the court of public opinion is valid in a criminal case. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you kind of mentioned that you were being sued. So, what battles are you still fighting lately? I'm being sued in the Eastern District of Wisconsin by the family of Anthony Huber. <laughs> so, you're still fighting this. Um, do you think that the media has, after the acquittal, do you think that they are still trying to put out inaccurate information about you? I know they're still putting out inaccurate uh, information. Like Houston Chronicle, I know they, uh, they are. They put out a bunch of inaccurate information. Same with Washington Post. I think they're somewhere in here. We've, we've got a lot of our, our good friends in the media. I know they are. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, the lawsuit isn't getting reported on very much. People aren't reporting on it. I think it's another attack because they know I'm coming. I have a lot of supporters who help me fight this, but they're not pushing any of my fundraising to media. They're not talking about it. They just they just wanted to be silent about it. Well, because also, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like they've kind of let people run with this now that we've had a chance to talk and I've gotten to know you a little bit, assumption that you're this like rich dude now. No. <laughs> I am not this rich dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, now after, after being acquitted and we're over a year out from this, surely you must have thought that that was the end of your battle or did you anticipate this being a continual battle that would be going to the point where people are raging and venues are canceling over you just being at a essentially private speaking engagement. No, not really. Like I knew there was gonna be a little bit of a battle, but I didn't know it was gonna be to the point to where if I post something on my Twitter, the entire left is gonna blow up and try to cancel a speaking engagement event for me and for Defiance Press and Heads were exploding because I posted it. They were like, no, this can't happen. Cancel this and Southern Star Brewery saying they're not going to host us, which was ridiculous. It's their right to do so, but I don't think, I don't agree with it because they said they were apolitical, but they hosted other things that were pretty political in my opinion. Yeah, uh, our friends at Texas, I remember the CEO said it was uh, Texas that they had a problem with, but I believe we found some pictures of Southern Star Brewery hosting a Texan event, which is an odd statement for them to make. Yeah, I think that's all I'm going to do. So, do you think that even now, now that you've been acquitted, and with everything else, and you have a lot of eyes on you still around the world, do you still feel like you are still having trouble getting the truth out? Yes, I think so. Uh, I believe my social media is still a little bit censored, especially on Instagram. I see, I can't seem to really grow that many followers there, but on Twitter, after my shadow ban was lifted, I'm doing pretty good. On Twitter, Instagram, I get no traction. I can't really promote anything. I can't promote anything on Twitter. I went, I go to Boost a Post. It doesn't let me boost it on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. So I do think I'm still being censored in that way. Elon, fix it. <laughs> we know you pay attention. <laughs> but that is, that's crazy. So you feel that these platforms are still hindering you from being able to raise money for your legal defense, even now, because your entire adult life has basically been spent fighting court battles. Yeah, ever since I was 17. 
I got acquitted and it was a short breath of relief and then I was served with the lawsuit. Tell me, how did that feel when you were served? After kind of, did you anticipate the lawsuit or were you kind of like, oh, here we go again? I'm not going to talk much about that because I actually wasn't physically served. So okay. I'm not going to talk because we're fighting that battle mm -hmm. right now. But I, would, I wasn't physically served in the lawsuit. But were you surprised that you're still having to fight legal battles? To, to be sued again? Yeah. But no. I was just like, when I found out that I am being sued again, I was like, again? This is ridiculous. Just as a young person who's starting to get their life off the ground, how does it feel that despite everything you've been through, despite being found innocent, despite everything that's come out, that people seem to pay attention to you in a way that honestly, even though I've been in this media landscape for a while, I have truly never seen before. Um, how does that make you feel? Like, talk about some of the crazy things that have caused you to trend on Twitter, for instance. Um, so I was, I was at SHOT Show just recently, um, National Association for Gun Rights had me out at their booth, and I was trending that entire week. I was like, how is this even possible? And I have no idea why half the time I was trending, but some of it was because of Southern Star Brewery, the other was because of another venue that canceled me. So Southern Star isn't the first venue that canceled me. Um, the Venetian, uh, the Oak Room there, they weren't gonna host me for an event there. We ended up not doing that event there. It's unfortunate, but it's what happened. I have a feeling this isn't going to be the first time. So, I mean, there's a lot of controversial people, you know, some which are in this room, but there's so many people who are figures out there in the world. Why do you think people are so fixated on you in particular? I don't know, because I don't think my life is that interesting, to be honest. I, like, I was sitting back there and I was playing Minecraft before we came up here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I'm 20 years old and... I don't know why the media is so focused on me, but it's, it's what, it is what it is. <laughs> Protesting Planned Parenthood, going out and Every going to change. a censorship um, rally. You can be attacked for that, for doing basic everyday things that you are entitled to do. And it's, in your, it's in our constitution that we should be able to do these things. We have a right to as Americans. Absolutely, we have a right to our freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the freedom to assemble, which, you know, uh, people don't want to see that. People don't want to see these conversations because I'm of the belief that if people heard more about your story and got to hear it from you and got to hear more about it, that perhaps some opinions would change. What do you think? I think so. I've talked to some people, so I'm going to tell a quick story. So, I was uh, at a photo shoot with my girlfriend. She does modeling, and her makeup artist happened to be a little And she was like, oh, hell not. Like, I don't, want to, I don't want to do this. And then me and her got to talking, and I was telling her my story. I was telling her what happened. And just, it's so amazing to see how quickly somebody's mind can change. And at the end of that, she was giving me a hug and saying, I'm so sorry for everything that you've gone through. I'm so sorry for you. You get what they've done to you. They completely lied to me, and I feel like I was taking advantage of it. She was like, the media used me. And she believed that you were this bad person. Hey, Steve. Person. At the time, 19-year-old kid, you did nothing wrong. And that has to be absolutely dehumanizing to have these huge media outlets with budgets outside of anything. <laughs> Neither you or I are rich people. Budgets outside of anything either one of us can comprehend. To use that to attack a, you know, at the time, teenager, now 20 year old. Absolutely. They, they continue to attack me, and this is stupid. It's, it's really, really disturbing because they didn't just hurt my right to a fair representation or a fair trial. They put my safety at risk. They put my life at risk. There are people that want to kill me because of what the media has said. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the things that you are having to deal with as far as that goes because of the media and the narrative that they have tried to push to the public? I have to have security in most places I go. A lot of people want to hurt me. At, at a America Fest, 
I would walk into the venue, I would walk into the convention center, and some car sped right past me, screaming, murderer, and I was just like, I'm by myself, this is scary, what if somebody wants to do something? Because security is expensive, and I can't afford it 24 7 if we're being realistic, but it's just, it's just disturbing to see that some people believe it, and that people want to hurt me, people want to hurt my loved ones, and the people close to me. And so there's a lot of us who have had to deal with censorship in one form or another, and a lot of us who have even had to deal with the media saying untrue, hurtful, false, damaging things about us. Um, what words do you have for those of us in this room today who are going through those struggles, or even somebody who's the next Kyle Rittenhouse, who might be going through the same struggles, who might be under the same scrutiny and microscope that we've experienced? I would say support independent journalists. We need to take over and abolish media. We need to take over and abolish media. We need to take over and abolish show our view counts to other people like the Bays or other people, other conservative media platforms that aren't going to censor our voices, that that are pro-speech, that will push any narrative, that will talk about anything. They won't have a one-sided opinion. They won't have a bias. We need to start <laughs> focusing on people that are, I'm going to say, conservative media. You know, and I agree. I think independent media is absolutely the way to go. I think more speech is better than less speech. I think more speech is the answer to <laughs> bad speech or things that we don't like, and ideas that we don't agree with. And so I really want to thank you, Kyle. Thank you for being here. Thank you for speaking with us this evening. Thank you all for coming. Tell us about your, your non-profit, your support, the Canines for Cops? Yes, Canines for Cops, ran by a good friend of mine, uh, Chris Michelle. And what do they do? Uh, they help uh, support law enforcement by putting dogs in police departments, uh, buying drugs, stuff like that, and also dogs in schools. Awesome. So Kyle has agreed, and, uh, and, and we can continue this past tonight, we're also going to do something like this with Justice so stay tuned here for a second. Um, Kyle has agreed to do a hog hunt on my ranch, and we're going to auction that opportunity off, take a couple people with Kyle, and go hog hunting at Brushwood Rose Ranch sometime in the near future. And so I think what we're going to do is we're going to put that on, on an auction thing online and uh, let you guys uh, uh, bid. And the proceeds for that are going to go to, to Kyle's nonprofit. Not my nonprofit, but my nonprofit. You're the one you support. Yeah. The one you support. All right? And, and if anybody wants to give an opening bid for that, we'll take it right here. <laughs> opening bid, if not, we'll put it online. All right? I'm going to ask Justin somewhere to come up. 400 is opening bid. Thank you, sir. We're going to continue that on because it's getting late, so we're going to do that online and continue that. Where is Justin at? Jeff Field. There you go. Come on, Justin, you mind coming up here real quick? So these two gentlemen, you know, give their time and money to you do it for a canine for cops. And uh, Justin, tell us a little bit about your organization. Hey, uh, Call Eagles Oscar. Uh, it's a call sign we'd say coming off the battlefield saying that all uh, American forces are okay. So we pass it out to the uh, aircraft usually. Call Eagles Oscar, I started it when I got out, uh, broke my back, banged up my head, um, on all kinds of medication, pretty much addicted, and, and uh, by anybody's standards and alcohol. And uh, we found this place, it's a brain treatment center, they use magnetic resonance. It sounds kind of scientific and weird. 
don't know all the details about it, but I can tell you that it works. The vet goes there for about four weeks, does uh, five treatments a week. Uh, so, you know, five days, he has a week off. He or she, we've treated hundreds of vets. It's about, uh, cost us about, we got it down to about five, six thousand dollars now for the guy to go through it, and uh, their lives are changing. A lot of guys are suicidal going there and uh, come out uh, as brilliant as they ever were. But uh, that's what we do, we've been doing it for uh, about six, seven years now. So I appreciate y'all that have supported it too. Thanks. So, so what are the something with the next two years of great degree? So, Mike, uh, well, maybe we can intertwine these somehow, maybe they're fine. But um, Justin is also green. Uh, at at Crestwood Branch, we have a uh, really cool outdoor fireplace that overlooks a big lake. And uh, so we're going to do a, a night of uh, shooting. Uh, and then after the shooting's over, uh, there's going to be bourbon and cigars. So we're going to make that available and we'll promote that and get that out to everybody. But appreciate your support. Thank y'all so much for coming. Thank y'all. Y'all be safe. Drive home tonight. Thank you pictures of puppies when he was playing Minecraft. <laughs> Not exactly uh, stuff that should be trending on Twitter. <laughs> but um, so how has the experience with the trial and censorship um, shaped or changed your worldview? Has it made you more conservative? Has it extremely? <laughs> I see other people getting censored, and I see like people like Turning Point USA or David Roberts and other voices being silenced, your voice being silenced on the, on the social media platforms. And I'm just like, they will report on, they'll promote the left all day long, but then when it comes to somebody who happens to fall on the wrong spectrum, they're like, gonna bury them in silence, they're not gonna let their voices be heard, and I'm not okay with that. This is, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's honestly, it's disturbing and sick. I don't know how that can continue to happen. I don't know how we can continue to be censored and people can just be overrated. Absolutely. No one should be okay with the fact that blatantly false, you know, the media wants to talk about misinformation and disinformation, and yet they are the greatest purveyors of it. Um, if you could talk to your 16-year-old self now, after everything you've been through, after all of this craziness, like, talk to 16-year-old Kyle, what would you say? That takes a second to think about. Um, well, 16-year-old me was just living a normal life, and I thought I was uh, doing the right things, uh, being a police support, a firefighter, could add. But what I would tell myself is everything can change. Nothing is permanent, everything can change, do not get too comfortable because the world may go ahead and try to screw you in some ways or the other, but it'll be all okay in that. Absolutely. You know.